I think the most interesting part was that we have seen people from different parts of the world, especially researchers who come from different disciplines from different countries. I hope JSS, which is a borderless community, can keep growing to influence more people, connecting the top scientists and young researchers. found out that it's nice to communicate with uh, young, educated people who can ask uh, very unusual questions which you have never thought before. They also kind of see that Nobel laureates are just normal, normal people and that allows them to get inspired to get uh, uh, achieve the same heights in their future career. Education to science is extremely important for people and extremely important for countries and uh, for our health and for our wealth. And I think that the GYSS is one important tool to disseminate this spirit around, attract young people and increasing the spread of knowledge in the society. The way that it brings together scientists from around the world, young scientists, students, is rather special. They often had the, the same questions, the same concerns, the same desire to be able to contribute to the scientific process. So GYSS is as relevant today as it was 10 years ago. In fact, more relevant than before. I hope that UISS will continue to engage in this important mission so that young people everywhere throughout the world will have this opportunity in order to get together to tackle and solve difficult challenges. This year, JYSS celebrates its 10th anniversary of the annual meeting between young scientists and engineers from all over the world, and outstanding scientists and engineers who got Nobel Prize, Phil Medals, Millennium Technology Prizes, and Turing Awards. Last year, besides the problem of COVID-19 pandemic, I had a severe accident and so I could not join the event even online. This year I can be with you online and I am allowed to send more Thai young scientists to the event than the previous years. Besides having the opportunity to learn from global scientists and engineers, from other young scientists and the visits to research institute in Singapore, these young people who are mostly in science and technology careers can be inspired to create the works that benefit Thailand and the world as they become successful professionals in science and technology that will inspire other children to pursue the same careers and the government could see the importance of promoting more citizens to study science and technology. I hope that young scientists and researchers in science and technology won't be discouraged by the obstacles they encounter and continue to do their best. I hope that they will always think of new things as GYSS moves on to the next 10 years. It's 10 years of Global Young Scientists Summit, and it's my pleasure to congratulate Singapore's National Research Foundation 
and also the organizers for having this this year. And I wish you a wonderful meeting. I'm very glad when I'm thinking of all the participants being the current or the former ones, because having exchange about science is one of the best things you can do. We in Lindau also had an anniversary last year. And of course, it's always great to have this recognition for the past. But at the same time, it gives much motivation and energy to carry on, particularly in times like these. Thinking of the young people, my message for you, young scientists taking up a career in science and technology would be do what you're really passionate about. Be always curious and ready to share your knowledge and a platform like the Global Young Scientist Summit is great for doing that. Sometimes I'm asked uh, if I could get advice. I'm not uh, within science, but my advice for further uh, careers, of course, with reference to a Nobel Prize would be, despite all very obvious value in applied sciences, uh, let's take COVID-19, do not lose sight of basic research also for the sake of future gener generations. And now I hope you enjoy the GIS 22 and wish you all the best for it. Many greetings from Lindau. The success of the Global Young Scientists Summit is a testament to the importance of borderless collaboration, the pursuit of excellence and the benefit of humanity. As we seek to tackle global challenges such as climate change, biodiversity loss and protecting human health, and to pursue the knowledge of ourselves and the universe around us, this is the bedrock of future research and it's your generation that will be in the forefront. The scale of these challenges may have inspired you all I'm sure the desire to expand our understanding and make the world a better place will continue to inspire your generation. While the challenges are great, your generation, like those before you, stand on the shoulders of giants. You have access to new knowledge and tools that can help change the world for the better. I urge you all to grasp the opportunities and pursue your passions. Young Scientist Summit, GYSS, was established 10 years ago in order to excite, engage and inspire young researchers to pursue their passion, develop uh, solutions in order to solve problems in our economy and in society. This has never been more necessary. For example, COVID-19 has impacted all our lives, devastated many economies, changed our social habits. In addition, the world faces existential challenges, two of them, climate change and environmental sustainability. If we are to have any opportunity or any hope of overcoming these challenges, we need fresh minds to think up novel solutions, consider out-of-the-box avenues, and be able to put together a coherent program What GYSS has done is to enable these young minds to collaborate together, exchange views and form a community which will give us some advantage in overcoming these issues. GYSS has done well the last 10 years. I believe that GYSS will continue to do well and will continue to engage our young researchers and inspire them to do great things. Congratulations to GYSS on your 10th anniversary. I believe uh, GYSS will continue to be relevant and will create new challenges and opportunities for all our young scientists and benefit the world and the scientific community. Congratulations.
Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Sudoff for this morning's plenary lecture. Tom is a professor at Stanford University School of Medicine and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. When Tom started his laboratory in 1986, he was interested in studying how neurons in the brain communicate with each other at the synapses, and specifically the mechanisms that govern the precise release of neurotransmitters at the synapse. For this work, Professor Sudoff received two highly prestigious uh, scientific awards in 2013, the Albert Lasker Basic Medical Research Award and the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. More recently, Tom's research emphasis has shifted to understand how synapses and neural circuits in the brain are formed and how their properties are shaped, resulting in changes in various neurological diseases. Today, he will tell us about drug development for neural diseases. And as a fellow uh, neuroscientist, I'm very, very excited to um, hear what Tom has to tell us. So a very warm welcome to you, Professor Sudoff. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me and I would like to express my appreciation for this very nice introduction. And I would like to express my apologies and that I have somewhat changed the content of my discussion with you here today, because it is so hard to do these things virtually. I thought it might be better to actually talk about a scientific project and to tell you a bit about our approaches to look, solve that project. And I thought that this would be particularly useful for younger scientists, because what I'm going to tell you illustrates our methods, our ways of trying to answer specific problems that are relevant for translation in your science, but address a fundamental issue. Now, another thing with virtual talks is <clears throat> that it's always more difficult to judge how long one is talking. Because when you are talking to real people that were there instead of a computer screen, you actually get a feeling for time much better than you when you do when you're sitting alone in my office here and <laughs> talking to <laughs> electronic devices. So I hope I will finish my talk in time, but I may have to stop at some point because I'm running over time. So my lab is engaged in a broad effort to uncover the biological consequences of genetic changes that predispose just neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders, many of which are based on synaptic dysfunctions, which is really what we focus on. And today I would like to illustrate this effort by describing two representative projects. And I apologize, as I said already, for changing the content of this talk. So what I'm gonna talk about in these projects are two very different molecules, genes that are both involved in synapses and that are both predisposing to neuropsychiatric disorders. Let me talk about neurexin 1 first. So for, what are neurexins? What is neurexin 1? Neurexins are presynaptic adhesion molecules that come in two major flavors, neurexins, alpha neurexins and beta neurexins. There's three genes with independent promoters for both of these variants. And there are thousands of mutations in neurexin 1 that have been identified in patients with diverse neuropsychiatric disorders, autism, Tourette, schizophrenia. When you look at these disorders in general, all of these disorders are genetic to some extent at least. And there's been enormous progress in understanding the genetic landscape of these disorders in recent years. What you see here is a figure taken from a paper from the Daily Lab from Meta Archive that illustrates the genetic landscape of schizophrenia, where you see the extent of an impact, the odds ratio in the y-axis and the, minor, the allele frequency in the x-axis. And what you can see here, first of all, is true for all neuropsychiatric disorders, namely that there's a lot of different genes that have different degrees of impact and are 
mostly rather uncommon in terms of mutations. The problem is that for most of these genes, we actually don't know what they do. Even for genes that have been studied for years, such as, for example, TRIO, which is a scaffolding gene, okay? Or let's say GRIA3, which is an amber receptor. Yeah, it's an amber receptor, but what exactly is unclear? What you can also see here is that the Nurexin 1 gene is actually one of the more common genes. It's fairly, compared to others, it's fairly on the right and it has a very high impact on schizophrenia. So this gene has a major effect on the risk for schizophrenia as well as other gene, um, diseases. And when you zoom in on the mutations that happen, it occurs that the Nurexin 1 mutations are almost exclusively deletions. And they're deletions of DNA in a large gene, the Nurexin 1 gene. And as a result, there are always loss of function and they're always heterozygous, or almost always. They predispose to many different neuropsychiatric diseases and because they do predispose to many neuropsychiatric diseases, the question arises, how is that? As it happens, there's no correlation between the type of mutation, the deletion, the size of the deletion, the location of the deletion within the gene and the disease. So what effects does this mutation have that it predisposed to disease and why does it predispose to so many different diseases? So to address this question, we took an approach that we developed over the years in my lab in collaboration with other labs at Stanford, especially Marius Wernick's lab, and in which we use ES cells, embryonic stem cells, or iPS cells, and we make human neurons from them, and we study these human neurons as a function of mutations. We introduced a conditional mutation in the human neurons for neurexin 1 that mimics the mutations seen in patients. When we analyzed these neurons, we found, as you see here on top, that the neurons looked perfectly normal morphologically. They had normal numbers of synapses, normal dendrites, axons, everything. But not surprisingly, that expression of neurexin 1 was decreased by about 40%. After all, they had a heterozygous loss of function mutation. We then looked at functional effects, synaptic transmission. And what we found as illustrated here was a 40% decrease in synaptic strength, suggesting that there's a direct consequence in the strength of synapses as a result of the deletion of one of the two alleles of neurexin 1. So this is a discrete phenotype that likely selects an impairment of a specific step in synaptic transmission. And that may be amenable at some point to pharmacological intervention. We wondered what might be the molecular correlate if there was any major changes in gene expression or in proteins. We found no changes, major changes in gene expression, tons and tons of minor changes, whatever they mean. But we did find one major change in proteins which is an increase in the levels of this protein cask, which is a scaffolding protein that binds to Nurexin 1. The mRNA levels were normal, so this is a secondary event. Cask is a presynaptic chemkinase Marduk type scaffolding protein that binds to Nurexins of unknown function. This type may account for the change in synaptic strength. The robust and selective functional and synaptic impairment of the heterozygous neurexin 1 mutant neurons was an unexpected. We didn't think that just losing one allele would get to such a major change. So we wondered if this change is actually detected in patient-derived neurons, not just engineered neurons. And to address this, we initiated a large-scale project where we investigated neurons that are derived from patients. In this project, as outlined here in A, we took the iPS cells from schizophrenia patients and matched controls that are only matched very superficially. They're genetically quite different. We generated 
these iPS cells, we then produce neurons from these iPS cells, and we use these neurons to study, as shown here, synapses as well as other neuronal properties. And all these experiments were done in parallel in two different institutions with different labs to ensure reproducibility. Because as you probably know, we have a reproducibility crisis in science. In parallel, we analyzed mouse neurons to determine whether the phenotypes that we saw in humans would be translatable to mice in order to enable efficient use of mouse as a model system. Let me first tell you about this cross-platform cross-lab validation. So we do the patient-generated IBS cells exhibit the same selective synaptic impairment. I'm not gonna go through the slide in detail. It would be too much time, too much work. I just wanna focus on the key facts, which is that when we look at the reproducibility as analyzed in two different labs and different coasts, the West Coast and the East Coast, Rutgers and the East Coast, Stanford on the West Coast, we reproduced exactly the phenotype that we saw previously in these patient-derived neurons with independent lines, suggesting that indeed, this phenotype is specifically observed as a function of the heterozygous mutation of neurexin 1. This large decrease in release probability just causes a major loss in synaptic strength that in turn is a plausible explanation for why these patients are predisposed to schizophrenia and Tourette and autism, depending possibly on other genetic mutations or accidental historical events in these people's lives. Is this also associated with a change in cask protein levels? Yes, it is. What you see here is that we see the same change in the patient-derived neurons as we did in the engineered neurons. In addition, we tested several proteins we hadn't tested before, including a protein on the right called Kayat 3 which is involved in kinurenic acid metabolism and which has been implicated in schizophrenia. And that you can see that this protein is also increased in levels, suggesting a potential pathway. So what emerges from all these student patient studies is that we have a robust phenotype induced by heterozygous neurexin 1 mutations at the very fundamental level. This is much stronger than what we had observed in primary mouse cultures. So we wondered if this was really something that's human specific. And this is particularly important because it's relevant for using mice as models. And so what we did in the second part of this project as shown here in B, is that we analyzed in parallel identically generated mouse and human neurons with the identical mutation to test whether they would have the same phenotype. And in a nutshell, what we found as shown here in this direct comparison, left are the humans, right is the mouse, that in the human cells, the phenotype was reproducibly there between different engineered mutations within patient derived neurons, whereas in the mouse, there was no mute phenotype in the spontaneous MEPSCs, and there was only a trend that was non-significant in synaptic strength, suggesting that mice and humans, maybe not surprisingly, are different, but for us, surprising at this very basic level and indicating that humans are more susceptible, more sensitive to heterozygous deletions of this particular gene. So heterozygous human but not mouse neurexin 1 mutant neurons exhibit a robust synaptic impairment that could serve as a basis for mechanistic and translational studies. Let me tell you about a second project, completely different, synapsin 1. In fact, synapsin was one of the first proteins I cloned when I started my lab, one of the first synaptic vesicle proteins that was ever molecularly investigated 30 years ago. 
In between, then, others found that there are mutations in synapsin 1, an X-linked gene that predisposed to autism and that are shown here. Now, synapsin is a multi-domain protein with a central region called C here that is an ATP binding region and an N-terminal A domain that is subject to PKA-mediated regulation, phosphorylation, and that binds to membranes. We again generated conditional knockout neurons from humans. And in these knockout neurons, we completely deleted synapsin 1, as you see here, as a function of Cree recombinase. As you can see here on the right by this immunocytochemistry for synapsin, it's gone, as it should be. But the neurons are otherwise normal in terms of the synapse numbers, in terms of their morphology. So we now have a model system to investigate in a genetically controlled manner the effects of immune synapse mutation. And so we tested the functional effects again using a variety of approaches, including electrophysiology. And we did this in conjunction with phoscolin that activates cyclic AMP synthesis because synapsin is such a prominent phosphoprotein. And what we found, as you can see here on the left, is that we com compared the synapsin deleted versus the normal control neurons, we found a profound change, not initially, very different from the neurexin mutation. Initially, the synaptic strength in the first response was normal. But during repeated responses, the strength of the synaptic response was decreased whenever synapsin was deleted. And this is illustrated in the cumulative trace at the bottom graph. When we looked at phosgolin, we found that phosgolin created the same phenotype in wild-type neurons as the synapsin knockout, and that the synapsin knockout prevented any effect of phosgolin, as you see here on the right. So what these results show is that synapsin one deletion on phosgolin treatment induced synaptic depression. They have the same phenotype, and that if you do one, you basically occlude the effect of the other, suggesting that in some ways, phosgolin acts by inhibiting synapsin one. So how does this work? And please recall, as I told you, that there's this N-terminal phosphorylation site in synapsin that mediates the, bi the uh, in this domain that mediates the binding of synapsin to membranes. And these are actually brings me back to studies that I performed in my lab 20 years ago, where we studied this biochemically. And what we found is shown in, the, in this very old graph from this paper in 1999, is shown here. On the left, you see synapsin A phosphorylation. On the right, you see the membrane binding. And when you look at the synapsin A phosphorylation, it is phosphorylated by cyclic IMP shown here on the left, dependent protein kinase. And this phosphorylation is inhibited with a PKA inhibitor. When you look at the right at the same conditions, the phosphorylation dependent protein kinase, phos uh, the PKA dependent phosphorylation of synapsin decreases its membrane binding. It increases its dissociation from vesicles. What you see here in this graph is the unbinding of synapsin. And if you block phosphorylation with an inhibitor, it blocks the effect. So this phosphorylation basically regulates the association of synapsin with synaptic vesicles and in conjunction with the previous data suggests that PKA-induced synapsin-1 phosphorylation causes a synapsin-1 dissociation from vesicles that then has some effect that we saw in the electrophysiology. What is this effect? To test what this effect is, we looked at the synapse structure using fast freeze electron microscopy. And in these experiments that were carried out with Christian Rosenmund in Berlin, Germany, what we found as shown here is that the human synapses look like mouse synapses, beautiful, with lots of synaptic vesicles. And when we quantified the synaptic vesicles as a function of the synapsin deletion, we observed that there was a loss of synaptic vesicles from the synapsin, from the synapsin, by the synapsin deletion, as you see here in two 
in, and this was independent of stimulation. Stimulation itself caused a small decrease that was not significant. But even after 30 action potentials, there was synapsin deletion still caused a loss. When we looked at phosgolin, as shown here at the right, phosgolin alone also caused the loss of synaptic vesicles. And this is only 30 minutes of phosgolin. So this is not days or anything. This is short-term phosgolin. And this loss of synaptic vesicles was not associated with a loss of protein. So the vesicles are not destroyed. Instead, they are redistributed away from synapses. And the addition of the deletion of synapsin on top of phosgolin caused a small but significant decrease, suggesting that phosgolin alone didn't have the complete effect as does the synapsin deletion. So this shows that synapsin deletion and phosgolin decrease vesicle numbers. And it also shows that the effect of synapsin gets less, although it's not completely abolished. There's no general loss of synapses. There's this loss of synaptic vesicles. There's no loss of synaptic vesicle protein. Now, can we visualize this loss of synaptic vesicles also in another way? And we can. We can do it by simple immunocytochemistry, by looking at immunocytochemistry for synaptic vesicle proteins in puncta, in synaptic puncta which show a clear-cut phenotype of either phosgolin or cre-dependent deletion of synapsin, as shown here for synaptotagmin or synaptophysin. When we compare that with a synapse marker, there's no change because the number of synapses are unchanged. It's only it's the synaptic vesicles that are changed. And so the question then arises, having a discovered a pathway here whereby PKA-induced synapsin phosphorylation leads to synapsin dissociation of some vesicles and dispersion of synaptic vesicles. Is this pathway controlled by a physiological signal, not just by phosgolin, which is a pretty bad drug. You don't want to have it, right? You know, is this actually a physiological reaction? And so to address this, we turn to presynaptic neuromodulators, which are incredibly important for in, in the brain. And we looked whether they would physiologically regulate synapsin phosphorylation. And what you see here is synapsin phosphorylation in human neurons. I'm not going to go through the detail. I just want to mention that serotonin increases phosphorylation and norepinephrine decreases phosphorylation. So physiologically acting neuromodulators can regulate synapsin phosphorylation in human neurons. And we can mimic the same thing with agonists for the receptors of these neuromodulators and specifically with norepinephrine receptor acting agonists as shown here on the right. And this then gives us a tool to check whether these neuromodulators will physiologically actually control synapsin phosphorylation dependent vesicle numbers. Okay, and to do this, we looked at this again. Now you see here an analysis of the synaptic vesicles using immunocytochemistry by measuring synapsophysin density and synaptotagmin density. And you can see that when you decrease the phosphorylation of synapsin, with these agents, you actually increase the puncture number, suggesting, yes, you do have the same regulation by neuromodulators. When you knock out synapsin, as shown here in yellow, nothing happens because you basically get a, it occludes the effect, right? You see the same thing for synapsin puncture, except that there's no synapsin left after the deletion. There's no effect on synapse numbers as measured with bassoon immunocytochemistry as shown here on the right. So this, moreover, rescue experiments demonstrated that this is dependent on wild-type synapsin 1 and the phosphorylation site mutants of synapsin 1 also have the same phenotype, demonstrating that this is indeed the synapsin phosphorylation induced by neuromodulators that make this happen. So as a summary then, what I've told you here is as a conclusion that activation of presynaptic neuromodulator receptors, norepinephrine, serotonin, when they increase cyclic AMP, 
you cause a decrease in neurotransmitter release during sustained stimulation because you increase synapse and phosphorylation, which then causes synaptic vesicles to disperse from synaptic clusters. When you decrease cyclic AMP, you cause an increase in neurotransmitter release during sustained stimulation because of the opposite effect, because of a decrease in synapse and phosphorylation causing an increase in synaptic vesicle numbers. Thus, this is a universal mechanism that regulates in a novel way how synapses function. Now, in the last minute or the last words I, of this presentation, I want to tell you that this is actually a universal mechanism that also applies to endocannabinoids, which are probably the most important neuromodulators in brain. They're the most important neuromodulators because they have the highest number of receptors and because they are also part of the response that we have, for example, for cannabinoids such as marijuana and their derivative drugs. And they are exactly subject to the same type of modulation. So what I've told you today in this very short presentation, which I was pretty data rich, so I hope it wasn't too fast. It didn't just fast by. What I've told you today is that in two different projects, we used human neurons to transdifferentiate it from stem cells, iPS cells and ES cells, as a way to analyze the fundamental effects of disease-associated mutations. I've told you about neurexin 1 mutations and synapsin 1 mutations. They differ dramatically in that the synapsin 1 mutations always lead to disease, and whereas the neurexin 1 mutations lead to different types of disease that can be of different severity. They also differ in that the type of synaptic impairment that is created by these mutations is very different. In the one case, we have an effect that results in a loss of synaptic strength initially in response to a stimulus train. In the other case, synapsin, we have a loss of synaptic strength that accumulates during stimulus trains. I've also told you that these different mutations operate in completely different contexts. One is the synaptic vesicle protein synapsin that regulates synaptic vesicle availability for synaptic transmission. The other one is a synaptic adhesion molecule that regulates the strength of synapses in a manner that we incompletely understand at present. What these things, however, share is that these types of experiments enable us to gain a molecular, more mechanistic insight into what these molecules actually do. And by gaining that insight, we achieve the first step, and this is only the first step towards building an understanding of these diseases and identifying potential drug targets that might help us to actually treat these diseases. Because as it happens in the current neuroscience arena, in the disorders of the brain, the only diseases where they are Reasonable treatments, as far as I know, are stroke and MS. And in these diseases, in stroke, this treatment that works is neurosurgical. In MS, these are MS is really a disease of the immunology system, of the immune system, and these are immunologically acting drugs. So we really don't have anything at this point in brain disorders that would help us treat these millions of patients who are suffering from these various different diseases. Okay, I finished my presentation and I think I'm in time and I would like to be, I'd be happy to take any questions, but before I do that, I would like to acknowledge the people who performed the work I discussed. Chang Hee Pak is a former postdoc who has now, is now an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Tamas Danko is a research associate in Marius 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 Vernick's lab 
Ingsha Zhang is a research associate in my lab, and Christopher Patzke, who did all the work on the synapsin studies, is now an assistant professor at Notre Dame University in Indiana. And this work was carried out in close collaboration with Marius Wernick and his laboratory, and also in part with Christian Rosenmund's laboratory in Berlin. We wouldn't be able to operate without funding, and the funding for our work that I discussed today is primarily from NIMH, with significant support by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sudor, for your very, very exciting talk. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, before, uh, um, before I start addressing or asking some of these questions, I have one of my own um, regarding your first project on Norexin 1. So you have shown that the Norexin 1 heterozygous deletions in the human um, induced neurons show this reduced synaptic strength. I was wondering if this is specific to um, the excitatory neurons, or would you also see that in the inhibitory neurons that you make with another method? That's a great question, and I wish I could answer it. It's a question that we have obviously asked ourselves, but it hasn't been on the highest priority in addressing this, and obviously it's an important question. I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question. I would suspect you would see the same impairment because it's a presynaptic impairment, and neurexin is present in both inhibitory and excitatory synapses. But I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Sure, <laughs> thank I... you. Um, there's another question on neurexin 1 um, regarding this non-conservation between mice and humans. And do you think this means that humans are predisposed to neuropsychiatric disorders during evolution? Well, the human brain arguably is more complex than those of most animals, although that sounds like a pretty anthropocentric view. Maybe that's not true. I don't know. Um, so I think at least in terms of rodents, the human brain is much more, or human neurons are much more susceptible to the mutation. Obviously, evolutionarily, this wouldn't show up because people with this mutation would presumably be evolutionarily disadvantaged, but the mutation is so rare, so you'd never see it. It's not the only case. It's been shown for other genes as well that humans are sometimes more susceptible, more sensitive to mutations. Yeah. This leads me to a related question. It's more general relating to um, model systems for modeling uh, psychiatric disorders. So you've shown that mice aren't exactly great models because they don't really model human diseases. But on the other hand, what do you think about the use of human iPS cells as models uh, for the disease, given that we can't see any behavioral defects in these neurons and culture? Yes, I think that is another excellent question that we grapple with a lot. Because it's not only for neuropsychiatric, it's also for neurodegenerative disorders that we have the same problem. I do believe we need to find the best compromise between the two principal systems, which are mice and humans. And I think we need to acknowledge at every step the limitations of these models. I think in particular that mice are sometimes in for human brain disorders, um, not only for human brain disorders, as a matter of fact, um, overinterpreted. I think it's valuable to do the studies in mice, and we do the studies in mice as well. I think it's important. I think for basic mechanisms, they are very, very, very useful. But I also think that some of these studies, major studies that are published, are not quite, um, maybe not quite appropriate in claiming that what is seen in mice is really that relevant. Um, and, you know, I mean, all these studies about the higher functions in mice that populate our journals, you know, about empathy and love and, um, you know, I think that that's our fantasy, that um, 
that that's just it's entertainment it's basically you know like james bond is has no very little relationship to reality and, and um you just have to be content at present that we can't really study these things and uh doing these types of experiments and claiming these things in mice to me is well it's fun but it's not exactly science yeah sure um, moving on to some questions from the audience. Uh, so there was a question about a microenvironment around neurons and synapse. And is there such a thing that may play a role in neurodegenerative disease onset, in your opinion? Oh, yes. My God. Yeah. Especially in neurodegenerative diseases. So, neuro so I showed you that um, schizophrenia, GWAS, in the beginning of my talk, landscape, right? Most of these genes that you see there, almost all of them are neuronal. When you do the same thing for Alzheimer's disease, a large proportion is, are genes that are expressed in astrocytes or microglia. So there's a tremendous effect of the microenvironment and macroenvironment of neurons. In fact, the non-neuronal cells provide a major contribution to the function of the brain, for sure to the function of neurons and to the diseases of the brain. I think there's no doubt. And a lot of us are studying those contributions because we feel that we need to understand them in order to be able to gain insight into these diseases. Thank you. Another question from the audience um, regarding endocrine cannabinoids, which you've uh, spoken about in your second talk. So is it possible to um, become schizophrenic after cannabis use, and uh, could there be any mechanisms to trigger this? I doubt it. I think my understanding is that cannabinoids are neither addictive nor are they inducing altered states that predispose us to psychosis. Very, very different from real hard drugs, from amphetamines or um, LSD or mind-altering drugs, you know, where I, I, I think there is a tremendous um, danger even. I'm, I think cannabinoids have danger for sure in the lives of individuals because of habit formation and altered mental states. But I'm actually almost convinced that these dangers are probably less than the dangers, let's say, of nicotine or of alcohol. Okay, so... And cannabinoids, the whole endocannabinoid system is incredible. It's undervalued, underunderstood because it's so diverse. Um, and um, getting at this system with more specific manipulations will be one large opportunity, I believe, for in the future, certainly for drug development. <clears throat> Sure. And regarding drug development on the cannabinoid receptors, this will be my last question from the audience. Um, do you think that this uh, targeting of the cannabinoid receptors in the brain could represent a novel therapeutic target for any kind of neuropsychiatric conditions? I believe that the receptors themselves are probably not the best target because there's only two receptors and virtually all of the receptors that are important for the brain itself Virtually all of them are a receptor called CB1. It's a single receptor, and it's the same everywhere. So there, there are plenty of receptor agonists and antagonists. There have been some in the clinic. Some have failed miserably. Um, <clears throat> so that is probably not the way to go. The way to go is to look at the machinery that regulates the release and synthesis and degradation of endocannabinoids, of the endogenous agonists of these compounds. And that's really where I believe are great opportunities. Thank you for the insights and thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you for having me. I hope that at least some of the audience got something out of it. And I appreciate everybody's listening to my talk. Thank you.
Uh, if possible, otherwise it's okay. Hi, hi good morning, Professor Whittingham. Good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Welcome to this session. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, this session's plenary speaker, Professor Whittingham. Professor Whittingham is a State uh, University of New York Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Material Science and Engineering at Binghamton and the 2019 Chemistry Nobel Laureate. He received his BA and PhD degrees in chemistry from Oxford University, where he is now an honorary fellow of New College. In 1972, he joined Exxon and discovered the role of intercalation in battery materials, which resulted in the first lithium rechargeable batteries that were built by Exxon Enterprises. Uh, he returned to academia back to State University of New York, Binghamton in 1988 to initiate a program in materials chemistry. In 2018, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering and received the prestigious Turnbull Award from MRS. Today, he's going to talk to us on the title, The Critical Role of Storage for Renewable Energy and Climate Change. So without further ado, I would like to pass the stage to Professor Whittingham. Thank you very much. And you can hear me, I hope. Um, what I'd like to do is give a, the big picture first and get into some of the details. So as we get, get more and more renewable energy, which is intermittent, we're going to have to store it. And I've shown you a few examples of storage here. Um, the, the large lithium ion facility, Moss Lanning in California. This is the largest facility in the world, but we always have to remember the, the best or at least the very largest means of storing electrical energy is by pumped hydro. And there are many, many facilities like this around the world, and they take up about 90% of the storage. And you all have phones or similar devices, all of which use lithium ion batteries. So when the Nobel Prize was announced, the Nobel Committee said that we had laid the foundation of a wireless fossil fuel society. What we have to new, do now is take action to help solve, solve some of the world's challenges. But let me just show you some of the issues we have. Um, climate change has really caused a lot of global messing up, a lot of disruption. And these are just slides with, uh, I think, the last six months. The floods in, the um, winds in Kentucky at the bottom there. In the middle, this is. Victoria Glacier in Banff National Park in Canada. This used to be full of glaciers 10, 15 years ago. It's retreated totally. Um, the top fire here is in Chile, and the lower one is the very recent one in Colorado in the United States. So this global messing up is impacting all of us, and it's only going to get worse. So let's just look up at a, a, a few issues. Climate change is going to happen. We are going to have to adapt to it, I think. I don't think there's any way of rolling it back. What we can do is prevent it getting worse and worse over time. So the first thing we have to do, we have to be willing to live with less fossil fuels. I'm not saying none, because I think that certain things like aircraft, we're always going to use fossil fuels. So cleaner renewable electrical energy will be the future. Um, the, the major sources of that that we're all familiar with are solar and wind. As I say, they are intermittent. Let's not forget also a lot of countries have a lot of hydropower, which is renewable, and some countries are now using tidal energy. So we have to use storage. Um, lithium batteries are the dominant form of portable storage. 
by far at this point. And when we talk about um, storage, we're talking about both the transportation sector and the electrical grid. So I'm predicting that within 10 years, maybe even sooner, many major cities such as Singapore will ban the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles and maybe ban their use totally. Somewhere like Singapore, an island state, travel is not very um, long distance. It's relatively easy to do that. And then your lifetimes, autonomous vehicles may become the norm. So you will not have to own your own vehicle. You will not have to charge it, put it in a garage. You'll pull out your iPhone, hit a button, and the vehicle will drive itself to your front door. The other thing that renewable energy will give us is a cleaner electrical grid. And if we look at these two combined together, if we have a very good batteries in our vehicles, then we will be able to link these together to make a more resilient grid. And I'll get into that a little later on. But we need to tie everything together and not separate them. But we have a number of sustainability challenges. It takes 50 to 80 kilowatt hours of energy to make a one kilowatt hour lithium battery. The long term, this is not a viable option. Quite a lot of this is due to transportation of the various materials. Going from the mine to the finished battery, and calculate some materials may travel 30 to 50,000 miles. So we really need to do more of the upgrading at the source. And this also gives the countries where the mines are value added, they won't just be shipping the ore off to um, two or three other countries where most of the batteries are made. So this ties down to really the issue of we're gonna solve part of the sustainability issue and at the same time, make the whole system more secure is to go away from the present global supply chain over the last decade, we've gone too global, we've got to pull it back somewhat and allow it to spread more. So each region in the world really needs to have its own supply chain, its own infrastructure, it's sort of, um, cut down the transportation. We as scientists really need to eliminate the critical elements from the batteries or and other devices. As an example, in batteries, cobalt has to go. It's too expensive. Really, the only place it comes from is Congo. And there's a lot of child labor and other issues based there. And things like graphite, nickel need to be sourced more locally. And Singapore has a great opportunity. You have the weather there that electric vehicles like. So you could easily be a model clean city for the world with only electrical, electric vehicles. But before we get totally electric and totally um, clean grid, we've got a number of challenges. Both the mining and the processing of the materials need much cleaner technologies, and we need to work on doing that. So let me just show you how dominant lithium-ion batteries are. Now I'll show you a number of examples here. Renewable energy, the sun and the wind. In farms in West Virginia, this is a 32 megawatt hour. Battery facility shifts the load and smooths the power. Then I show you a whole range of um, vehicles from the little two-wheeler in Bermuda all the way to large trucks. And these are um, Mercedes buses you'll see in Europe. So electric vehicles are taking over little by little, and there's now far many options. The red car here is a Tesla, and the green one is a BMW. So the major automakers are now getting into the business. So, but let me, before I get into the challenges and opportunities, let me very briefly mention what a lithium battery is and what it isn't. So lithium batteries are based on intercalation. What we mean by that, if you look at the little green ions here, they are inserted within the crystalline lattice. In case of the 
anode. It's graphite. In the case of the cathode, it's normally a layered compound. Originally, this was TIS2. It's now a, a range of materials, but particularly oxides. So the lithium ions go in and out of these materials. So they shuttle when fully charged in the anode. They move through the electrolyte into the cathode. And I'll show you in a moment why we do not have any lithium metal in these batteries. Okay. Little bit of history here. Back at Exxon in 1970s, we used pure lithium metal. It tends to form dendrites. These are spiky protuberances that go across the cell and short it out. So Exxon pretty quickly switched to lithium aluminum, which works well for maybe 50 charges. But it was Akira Yoshino who discovered that various um, carbons with a graphitic phase could store the lithium. And that's what I actually show you here. But the challenge with this, this is it takes two grams of carbon to store seven grams of lithium. And the carbon, in fact, takes up half the volume of the cell. So if we want high energy density systems, we've got to get rid of most of the carbon. The present approach here is to um, look at tin or silicon. Both of these react with more than four lithium ions each. So their volumetric energy density is essentially the same as lithium. And the holy grail is to go back to lithium metal itself. On the cathode side, we started with the lead compound TIS2. Um, John Goodenough was working on cobalt oxides, their magnetic behavior, and recognized they had the same structure. So he looked at their electrochemical behavior, and you all know the history. So all your cell phones are basically still lithium cobalt oxide. I mentioned earlier, cobalt is too expensive. So this same structure is now made up of nickel, manganese, and a little bit of cobalt, or in the case of Tesla, cobalt and a little bit of aluminum. But there's a lot of interest now in going away from these expensive metals to lower cost and safer phosphate materials, such as iron phosphate, but these have a lower energy density. And um, so we and others now looking at, can we in fact put two lithiums into these phosphates to make them behave more like the lead oxides and have the same energy density. So why don't we use um, lithium and lithium batteries? This is why, and this is a study that Russ Kinelli did at Exxon about 1975. When you charge a battery, you're electroplating lithium out. So you got one electrode on this side, this one. As soon as you got these little protuberances formed and the electrical field between this tip and the other side is higher. So they then grow exponentially. So the, the difficulty in lithium batteries is to stop these um, dendrites for go straight through the normal separator. If they do that, then you have fires, as of this case, at and had in Texas. So that's why lithium is not really used anymore in batteries. There is one exception, but otherwise they're just not used. So if we go back to our TIS2, why was titanium sulfide looked at initially? It gives almost a perfect cathode. It's really the model compound, except its energy density isn't all that high. It's a metallic conductor. So you don't need to mix any carbon with it because you've got to remember in an electrochemical cell, you're moving lithium ions, you're also moving electrons. So you've got to make sure those can go in and out. And this is data from back in 1973, run at 10 milliamps. This is about five to 10 times what you use today. Um, commercial operators also like the fact that in these materials, it is slightly slopy. Being slightly slopy, it means that you since you got what you can call a gasoline gauge, you know how full or empty you are. Okay. I needn't address the fact that um, it's layered and there's no phase transition in here. I should point that out. So it's a single phase all the way from zero to one lithium. So you're not spending any energy nucleating a new phase. It's still very much of interest, TIS2. So Linda Nazar in Canada 
found out that magnesium would go in, in and out of this material very readily. And the, you can see the slope behavior is almost identical to lithium. The big difference is it's about one volt lower. It's operated at um, an elevated temperature as compared with room temperature for the um, lithium case and the current density is much lower. So TIS2 is a model compound, lithium preferred one because the lithium energy density is um, twice that of magnesium. So magnesium, good model area, but not realistic for commercial application. So if we look at today's batteries, now, how do they stand? Can we improve them or not? And if you just look at the data I put inside that red oval, the percentage number there is the percentage of the theoretical energy density that we actually get in real cells. And you can see it's a tiny fraction, 11% to 25%. On a volumetric basis, it's about 25% on a gravimetric. So it's still a huge opportunity to increase that energy density. And um, we believe we can should be able to at least double that. But it means we've got to take out most of the carbon. Um, we need to put more lithium in there. And ideally, we need to do science on our materials to make them better ionic and electronic conductors. If we can do that, then we can use thicker electrodes so we can eliminate part of the dead weight from current collectors and the separators. So let me just show you where um, we stand right now and what we're trying to do. So initially in these layered oxides, there was equal amounts of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. That's shown up here. This has the highest thermal stability to so all these layered oxides are metastable. If you heat them up after they've been charged, they will evolve oxygen. This oxygen then is an internal source to burn the battery. So we'll have to be very careful. So this is the safest one, but this capacity is only 160. If you go to more than 80% nickel, you can get well over 200, but then its thermal stability is 100 degrees lower. So there's this trade-off between energy and safety. And I should emphasize, we never expect to get to these temperatures, but this thermal stability is that direct measure of how reactive these materials are with the organic electrolytes. And I show on here, this is where you want to get to 100% capacity retention and the highest energy. And you can plot this peak oxygen evolution temperature versus the nickel content. And it's essentially a straight line independent of how fully charged the system is. So what we have to do is really modify these systems so we can increase the energy density, eliminate any of the side reactions, stop this oxygen evolution. And we're doing this through what is called a Battery 500 Consortium run by the Department of Energy in the United States out of Pacific Northwest National Lab. And this is a typical layered oxide. It's what we call meatball morphology, the 100 to 200 nanometers. The secondary particles, these are about 10 microns across. They pack very well to make a dense cathode. What we've been able to do over the last five years is increase their lifetime, increase their energy density, and same time the commercial cells are coming down in cost. But as I say, there are issues with um, the safety here. So this is the data. This is an ex-PhD student of mine, Jay. And you can see how we've progressed number of cycles over the years. We started out at 300 watt hours per kilogram. Over here, we're now at 350. We, as of today, I think we've got over 800 cycles out of this at 350 watt hours per kilogram. And we've got roughly 100 cycles now out at 400 watt hours per kilogram. And I should emphasize these are real energy densities. So these are the cells we use. Um, we weigh the cells, we measure the volume, and energy we've got in and out. So be very wary when you see data and literature 
it quite often only consider the active materials. So this is where we stand. We um, expect to go quite a bit further and better. This project has just been extended for a second five years. So we're now going after 500 watt hours per kilogram. Again, using these um, layered oxides, but also using a much lower cost and higher energy density system in principle, and that is um, lithium sulfur. So sulfur is essentially free. Lithium sulfur will today give you about 400 watt hours per kilogram, but it's low on volumetric energy density, but there's serious um, technical challenges because sulfur is an outstanding ionic and electronic insulator. So it's difficult to get materials to react. So what we're trying to do at the energy density up is use, as I said, all the material. One of the things we've discovered with these layered oxides, and this is a typical cycling curve. First cycle, you charge it up to about 4.3 volts. You discharge it and you never get back all the capacity you had to begin with. And this is known as the first cycle loss. If we can recover that, then we should be able to get above 400 watt hours per kilogram with these materials. We believe this is due to slow lithium in diffusion at high lithium contents. And in fact, we measured this. And here's the lithium diffusion coefficient here. It's about 10 to the minus nine centimeters squared per second until we've got about 75, 80% of lithium in then it falls off the cliff, dropping by over three orders of magnitude. We now know that this is due to what's known as a die vacancy mechanism. So for lithium ion to jump in this lattice from this point to this point, it needs two vacancies. There are fewer and fewer of these die vacancies as you fill the lattice up. And you can think about a lecture theater, if you are sitting in a lecture theater now, if that lecture theater is 75% full of people, then if somebody else comes in, everybody has to move because invariably the empty seats are in the middle. So it's a very similar thing. And taking the lithium out, there's no problem. It comes to the diffusion coefficients the same until the last little bit. So the same analogy with the lecture hall, at the end of the talk, everybody just flows out. So we're tr trying to solve that and we're doing some modification of the materials so we can reduce this first capacity loss. We've reduced it by more than 50% at the moment. We think we can get it even lower. But there's a number of other challenges in these materials. As I mentioned at the beginning, we would like to have batteries that will last a million miles or so. If they'll last that long, then we can hook up our cars to the grid at all times when the cars are not actually moving. So this will give smoothing of the grid. It will allow you to um, have electricity in your home when the grid goes down. So it be more resilient. So there's a fire and the utility turns off the power, you will still potentially have power in your house. So the way to do this is to make the materials less reactive, that means we need lower surface area, so there's less side reactions. And we go back historically looking at what's happened in the past. Initially, at the Exxon TIS2, we use these single crystals. These are probably 100 microns long and about um, five to 10 microns thick. When Sony was making lithium cobalt oxide. They also use single crystals. Uh, this particular picture is from Jeff Don. Um, Sony actually used single crystals of above 10 microns in size. Again, to reduce the side reactions and to make their Walkman players and so on somewhat safer. But to increase the power, commercial cells today have these meatballs, um, much smaller particles. I said these are primary particles are 100 to 200 nanometers. The large particles about 10 microns. So fairly large surface area. So what the thinking is, 
if we go back to single crystals, yes, we'll lose some of the rate capability, but we'll have much longer lived. So Jeff Don made this 50% nickel material and speculated that it could last for a million miles. And I say, you need this to allow grid EV interaction. Um, issue with the meatballs, why they don't last so long. These little particles as the lithium goes in and out, they expand and contract. So where they're wedged up against each other, they will then cause the meatball itself to crack, not the primary particles, but that large meatball. That exposes fresh surface to the electrolyte and it then gets side reactions occurring on that surface. If you have single crystals, then these are not um, wedged against each other in the same manner and they do not crack. And as Jay said, provided you keep their size below about three microns. So ideally you want these particles, two microns to say five microns in size. Um, and I speculate that this will be probably the future, particularly if we want long lived batteries. If you want very high powered cars, you're probably going to um, reduce the life and use meatball type, type morphology. So what we're doing, looking at what is the optimum morphology of these materials. You can see this is really the um, layered compounds, which all these are. The diffusion is into the edges of these crystals, not through the flat plane. So this is not the ideal morphology. So we want to find out what the ideal morphology is. And these are some of Jay's single crystals that she used. And this is now 76% nickel. So high nickel materials. But the other option is to go away from these oxides altogether and work on phosphates. As I said, the phosphates are more stable. They don't evolve oxygen. So they're, they're safer. They have a lower energy density, but we can probably solve part of that issue by putting two lithiums in. So we've been looking at these vanadyl phosphates. So you've got the vanadyl very distorted octahedra and then the phosphate tetrahedra. These now have tunnels where the lithium ions reside. And these tunnels are in all three dimensions, so they're not readily um, blocked. We are able to make these about 100 to 200 nanometers in size. These little cuboids are all the same shape. And I show you the electrochemistry on the right here. Remember, we're putting two lithiums in. So in here, we're going from vanadium-5 to vanadium-4, then from vanadium-4 to vanadium-3. If you look at the black line here, this is the first time we cycle it this way and coming back here. The purple line is the 50th time. So if anything is behaving better on the 50th cycle, than on the first cycle. So we got proof of concept that we can put two lithium as ions in a structure without damaging the structure. And in fact, this structure only expands by about 10% when you put that, those two lithium ions in. But there are still challenges here. In this region here, we see the bumps and the slopiness. This is some lithium ore, but this is single phase, extremely high rate in this region. But up here, this is now a two-phase region between VOPO4 and LIVPO4. So this tends to be somewhat more sluggish. So we have to modify this to make it um, more reactive so we can get the high rate reactions going on. So we're studying that at the moment. The other point I want to make is, I mentioned earlier, uh, Battery 500 Consortium, this has about 12 different partners in it. And that's what you need to make major breakthroughs in this field and to make major progress. Um, the Vandal phosphate work we did was one of the Energy Frontier Research Center consortiums. And in these consortiums, you want to have great experimentalists, you got to have theorists to guide you, and you got to have characterization experts, typically in the national labs where you've got synchrotrons, and it needs all those skills to make things work. Include with a, a few remarks that we all like to be disrupted in a positive manner. So mobile communications disrupted us. 
This was really the birth of the lithium battery. This is where it um, made its breakthrough and enabled this mobile communications. And this has been mostly for the good. The second issue we've had the last two or three years is really COVID disrupted humanity. And this is mostly for the bad. But we learned a few things. We learned, I think to everyone's surprise that we could build a vaccine within about 12 months. We identified some real supply chain challenges where we globalized too much. So that's going to get reined in. And the disruption we're getting now is really climate change. So it's messing everything up. And lithium batteries can come to the rescue here. As I said at the beginning, we are going to have to adapt as well. We know back to where we are. But it's best if we're on the active controlling side that we're controlling what happens. And we as scientists can overcome some of these challenges. We can generate some solutions. And for all the students listening, I advise you, enjoy your research. Do what you like doing. Do something new and be willing to take risks. Don't be too conservative. If you're too conservative, you won't make breakthroughs. Thank you very much, and I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Whittingham, for the for the very interesting and informative talk. We have several questions, and I will try to go through some of them and, and probably couple some of them. Uh, the first one was, uh, uh, you mentioned that, you know, Singapore has the perfect weather for lithium-ion batteries or for electric cars in general. Uh, so some of our audience would like to know, what do you mean precisely by that when you say Singapore has a weather that electric car likes? Could you elaborate, please? Yes. So lithium batteries like operating under exactly the same conditions as we humans do. <laughs> so they're happy, and I don't know how to put it in centigrade terms, but in Fahrenheit terms, between about 45 degrees and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So they don't work very well in very cold climates and they don't work very well in hot climates like Arizona. Yep. So California is a great place to do it. And I think Singapore has this you know, climate, never gets very cold and then never you know, make it humid, but it doesn't get super hot. Th thanks, thanks, Professor Whittingham. Uh, the other questions are all more towards uh, the, the notion that as we have more and more renewables in our power supply chain, that's really, we see an emerging demand for high capacity energy storage and batteries. So I'm coupling a few questions here to see, uh, get your view on uh, which do you think are the promising batteries if the future? Uh, uh, what about other options like hydrogen? Uh, your thoughts on that? Um. I, let me just say hydrogen will work if you can make hydrogen green. Most of the hydrogen is now made from fossil fuels, oil and things like that. that that's just not acceptable. And in addition, the, the full cycle of making the hydrogen and using it, it's got to be energy efficient. So there's a number of challenges there. And particularly when we've looked at it for cars in in say smallish cars, it doesn't make too much sense because the hydrogen infrastructure is not really there. It costs a lot of money to put a hydrogen recharging station in place, but it's ideal, I would say, for large trucks, fleet vehicles, where you can have a hydrogen charging station at the central garage of that fleet, or you can have them on major highways where trucks would refuel Batteries are not going to work for very large trucks. They carry more batteries than they can carry freight. Um, the challenge with any other battery today is lithium-ion batteries have got so low cost, it's going to be very difficult for other batteries to break into the market without them finding a high cost initial market to test and then they can reduce their cost. But no, sodium has certainly come in at some point Mm -hmm. um, none of the air systems, I think, are viable. Um, for very large grid storage, maybe some flow batteries, but any flow system, you need professional folks there all the time to watch 
over them because they got pumps running, they got corrosion issues, and so on. So it'll take time for anything else to break. And I think most lead acid storage is gone now, being phased out for lithium iron. Great. Thanks, Prof. Ittingham. Uh, a follow-up, uh, several members of our audience would like to know your opinion on biofuel as an alternative clean energy uh, because the carbon emission is sort of offset uh, by the carbon sequestration of the plant ingredients. Uh, so few of them are would like to know your opinion on this. I think it's a little phony. Um, <laughs> Britain is importing huge amount of wood pellets from the United States and claiming that's green. But my understanding, burning wood is worse than burning coal in the amount of CO2 generated. And it's not clear people are being totally honest when they do the full cycle of you know, CO2 capture and CO2 regeneration. So biofuels, if you've got those waste, we might as well use them, but I'm not sure we should deliberately use them. Um, what I'd like to say is, you know, People like to have um, more ethanol in the fuel, maybe from corn and things like that. So what we'd ideally like, rather than burn the ethanol, is come up with fuel cells that will work with ethanol. And that's a real chance because we've got to break that carbon-carbon bond. But that would be much cleaner. Yep. Great. Th thanks. Um, this is also a, a question from several people. Uh, when do you think solid state lithium ion batteries or solid state lithium batteries can be successfully developed? Uh, what's the biggest technical problem of solid state batteries? Uh, is it the interface or the ionic conductivity? All of those things. I think <laughs> you have to remember solid state batteries are commercial now. Blue Solutions in France makes a lithium polyethylene oxide solid electrolyte lithium ion phosphate batteries. Um, they're used in little cars that you can rent by the hour in Paris. The Mercedes bus I showed you that has those um, batteries in it, but they had a fire recently. So it's not still clear if you use an organic, even if it's a polymer, that it um, won't burn. So the, the real challenges, I think, are interfaces. If any of the components expand or contract, you may break that interface. The challenge the battery industry is, is worried about is how much will it cost to make them compared with today's lithium iron? Mm -hmm. And I you know my suspicion is you're going to find them getting put into things like you know, smart watches, phones as a kind of test bed before you get see them into large, um, say, electric vehicles. So again, maybe medical sensors, things like that, where we can try them out, make sure they do work. But they're going to happen. It's just a matter of how long it will take. Thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Prof. Ittingham. The next question is really uh, the environmental concerns of older generation batteries. Uh, I, I presume they're referring to the cobalt in, in, the, in the handphone batteries and also EV batteries. Uh, how serious do you think would that be? And, and how can we circumvent such, such issues? Um, we got to change human attitudes. <laughs> it's, where I live in New York State, it's illegal to throw out batteries into the trash, but people do. We have the largest recycling facility for lithium batteries about 100 miles from where I live. It's operated by a Canadian company. And they say they can't, in fact, get enough batteries so that it's operating profitably. The cobalt is worth a lot of money. The nickel's worth money. And the copper current collectors are worth money. So they're in operation. There's operations in, I know, in Europe, in Belgium. Apple has their own system going. And I'd be very surprised if most um, Asian countries don't have you know, lithium battery recycling. That's going to be a major source of nickel and cobalt and copper for future batteries. It's going to happen. We just have to stop people from tossing their old batteries. And as I tell them, if you've got batteries in your closet, recycle <laughs> them before they catch fire or something goes wrong. But no, there are recycling facilities in 
most of the major countries in the world now, and the recyclers will happily take your old batteries. True, Ag agreed on that. Uh, switching gear, uh, we, I have a, a question a bit more non-technical. Uh, as a student would like to uh, know, would like you to share your graduate student mentoring style if, if you're open to sharing Professor Whittingham. Yeah, my style is really to let them do their own thing. I do not treat them as technicians. <laughs> uh, no, we, we are, we, no we're, we're paid by the federal government in the United States on, under contracts. So within the defines of those contracts, they can pretty much chew on to do. But I do not lead them, as we say, by the nose. This is what you can do. That's what you can do. I let them do their own thing and learn. But we're all there to help each other. So we, as I say, we work in consortiums. My graduate students talk to graduate students on the other campuses and in the national labs. So we tend to work as teams. And we have group meetings where only the students are there. So they don't get embarrassed if they make a mistake. So <laughs> they always work well, profs there. What happens if I say something silly? We, we say we won't be there for some of these meetings so they can interact with each other. And you know, I think that tends to be the general style. I know some people say, do this, do that. That's not my style. I learned at Oxford, my advisor went on sabbatical, left me alone to do it. It worked out well. I went to Stanford. My advisor left for two years. I basically ran his group for two years. So again, I have the freedom to do it and say to students, you've got to do what you love doing. Do something different, do something new. Don't just follow what everybody else is doing. Th thanks for the advice. I, I'm sure the students will definitely benefit. Uh, uh, just one, one other question is, uh, electric vehicles do not directly emit CO2 as we know, but they require electricity for manufacturing and charging. So I guess in total, well to wheel, how much do you think the widespread use of EVs will improve climate change? It all depends where the electricity comes from, right? Sure. So if the electricity is green, in other words, if it comes from solar or wind, it, it should be good. But if the electricity comes from burning fossil fuels, so, you know, the clean fossil fuels, it's, it's going to help. But I know in places like Australia, where they ship all the good fossil fuels to China and to Asia, then burn the dirty coal in Australia itself, it's going to make the situation, in fact, worse. So you've got to use clean electricity. Yep. Uh there's one more question, uh, Prof. Ettingham, if I can. Uh, we start yeah. to hear about quantum batteries using superabsorption phenomenon. What do you think about this technology? Is it again a way to use the fashion word quantum? I, I think you're probably right. It's probably uh, it's in fashion. There's money there, so they're going to use it. But I t tell everybody when asked, 90% um, of what you read and the battery A is hype, so don't believe it. Really be critical when you read something and see if it makes sense. Agreed, agreed, Professor Whittingham. So that, that's all the time we have. We have a lot more questions. Uh, I would like to take the time to thank Professor Whittingham again for the fantastic uh, uh, eye-opening lecture on lithium-ion batteries and for the great discussion. Thank you all. Thank you.
Professor Chek is a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1989 on, RNA, on catalytic RNA. And besides that, he has been conferred the National Medal of Science, Heineken Prize, Canada Garden in International Award, Albert Laser Basic Medical Research Award, Golden Plate Award, Hummer Gold Medal, and many other honors. Professor Chek is a um, role model in the RNA field. He discovery of the catalytic RNA fundamentally changed our understanding of how RNAs work by showing that RNA can, similarly to proteins, undergo biocatalysis. In recent years, um, Professor Chek has turned his attention to looking at R, uh, RNA's role as a ma master regulator in epigenetic silencing. So today, we're really honored to have him um, give us his lecture. Thank you. Hello and greetings from Boulder, Colorado in the United States. Um, at last year's wonderful Global Youth Science event, uh, I spoke about some current events that had to do with RNA, such as the CRISPR genome editing for which Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier received the Nobel Prize and also the coronavirus and the messenger RNA vaccines. So having talked about that more general topic last year, I thought I would talk about some work that is closer to our own research because I still have a very active research laboratory and we are working on the complete replication of the very ends of our chromosomes. This topic may be a bit technical in some places, but I will try to give a very general introduction so that those of you who are not cell and molecular biologists should be able to follow most of the work. Now, what are telomeres? They are the very ends of our chromosomes. And here you can see this array of human metaphase chromosomes, and they are decorated uh, with a probe that lights up a particular sequence. And this is the sequence of DNA at the very ends of our chromosomes, and you can see that it is conserved, that there's the same sequence at the end, at the two ends of all of the chroma, chromatids of our chromosomes. So the question then is how are these very ends of the chromosomes maintained? And it turns out that in most of our somatic cells, they are not maintained, and this telomeric DNA shrinks as our cells divide. And when the telomeres get to be short, then the cells stop dividing. And this is a good thing because it's a tumor suppressor mechanism. We don't want the cells in our body to keep growing and growing and dividing uh, when we are adults. There are some exceptions. Stem cells, for example, must continue to divide, but most of the cells in our body in our body are better off if they stop dividing. And so the enzyme that does increase the length of our chromosome ends early in embryogenesis, when of course we do need to keep our cells dividing, and also in our stem cells, is called telomerase. It was discovered uh, by Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider, who won the Nobel Prize for that discovery, and as I will talk about it, uh, they also discovered the RNA subunit shown here as the purple ribbon. And then my laboratory discovered the necessary protein subunit called telomerase reverse transcriptase. And it was really the combination of the RNA and the protein that allows telomerase to work. And this is a good thing for our stem cells but unfortunately the telomerase gets reactivated in human cancers and this makes the cancer cells immortal. It allows them to continue to divide in an uncontrolled way, much to our own detriment. Now, Blackburn and Greider also found this RNA component of telomerase. They found it in a ciliated protozoan called tetrahymena fresh water ponds throughout the world. 
And as you can see at the top diagram of the RNA, that this is a fairly small telomerase RNA. Vertebrates, including humans, have a somewhat larger telomerase RNA shown in the middle. And uh, other species, such as the yeast that is responsible for uh, our bread and our beer, uh, is uh, the organism Saccharomyces cerevisiae has a very large telomerase RNA. But what is common about all of these telomerase RNAs is that they have this region called the template that determines the sequence of the DNA that is laid down at the ends of our chromosomes. And so uh, how does this enzyme work? Well, here is a, an animation that I hope is playing. And the blue strand is the RNA template that I was just talking about. The green lines are the active site of the TERT enzyme. And then you can see the red telomeric DNA is um, being extended by six nucleotides and then ratchets back, binds again, and is extended by yet an additional six nucleotides. So let me tell you first what I will try to explain uh, in the next 25 minutes. So first of all, that telomerase is the enzyme that extends the G-rich strand of the telomeres, this repeated sequence TTAGGG in humans, somewhat different in other organisms, that the telomerase, as I already said, has both RNA and protein components, that the discovery of this telomerase reverse transcriptase by Joachim Lingner, a postdoctoral fellow in my own laboratory, was done first in Euplotes. And this turned out that this work in this pond animal uh, gave a clue to how cancer works. And that's something we we do in biology all the time is we use an organism that makes it easy to learn something about biology. And then we trust that since everything is related through evolution, that whatever we learn in a lowly pond animal like Euplotes has a good chance of being relevant to the human condition. That was certainly true with telomerase. Then I'll show you how we can watch single molecules of telomerase moving around a living cancer cell, an enormously amazing technology that allows us to see how telomerase searches for telomeres. And then I'll finally talk about some very recent work about synthesis of the other strand of the telomere, the C-rich strand, which you can see by its sequence is repeats of a sequence that are of course complementary they match the sequence that is laid down by telomerase. Now, again, here is the uh, artist's drawing of the telomerase enzyme. And now I want to point out in a little bit more detail this template region of the telomerase RNA. And it is making the repeated sequence at the end of the chromosome you may, if you had sharp eyes, you will notice that this is a little bit different sequence than I talked about for human, which was TTAGGG, because this is the sequence from Tetrahymena, which is the organism from which Greider and Blackburn originally uh, purified telomerase. Now, the organism that we use to find the protein is this little pond animal called Euplotes ediculatus, and why would we choose this microscopic organism in our search for uh, purification of telomerase? Well, that's because unlike humans that have only 23 times two in a diploid cell, 46 chromosomes, Euplotes has 100 million chromosomes, very small ones, per nucleus, and this allows it to have a, a large amount of telomerase. And as a, as a biochemist, we want to use an organism that exaggerates the telomerase, makes a lot of it to make it easy to find. And then we use 
the Human Genome Project, and it took many years to find the Euplodes telomerase reverse transcriptase, and then only a few months to use the Human Genome Project to find the related human version of that protein. Now, again, what does this have to do with cancer? And the answer was not found by us, but was found by two groups, uh, Franklin Wong in Levi Garraway's group and Horn uh, and co-workers at the German Cancer Center in Heidelberg. Uh, Huang et al. were at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in, in um, Boston in the United States, Horn et al. Uh, in Heidelberg, Germany. And so what they found was that there was a mutation in the regulatory sequence, the so-called promoter of the gene that we discovered, the TER gene, that was present in multiple cancers, but was not present in the normal tissue next to the tumor tissue. And amazingly, 80% of all melanoma samples independently isolated from around the world had the same single base pair change in the TERT promoter. 80% of the brain cancer called glioblastoma, 70% of bladder cancer, 40% of liver cancer. So very common, the third most common mutation in all of cancer after KRAS and P53 mutations. Interestingly, this mutation is absent in breast and colon cancer and some other common cancers, but these still reactivate the TERT gene and they do so epigenetically rather than through a genetic mutation. And as I already alluded to, this reactivation of telomerase in cancer is um, a bad thing to have too much of it, but it has to be very tightly regulated because too little telomerase, an insufficiency of the telomerase enzyme, even if you have just half the normal amount, that causes a variety of diseases uh, that are due to stem cell, that where a stem cell process uh, is insufficient. And so you don't want too little telomerase in the stem cells, you don't want too much telomerase because it's one step towards cancer. Now I would like to turn to this question of watching the telomerase enzyme move around the human cell nucleus in real time. And the question that we asked was how does telomerase, a rare ribonucleoprotein enzyme, there are only some hundreds of copies of it per human cell nucleus, how does it find the very ends of our chromosomes? Because that also is a very rare part of the nuclear uh, milieu. And so this is like looking for a needle in a haystack. How does telomerase find where it needs to go? And this was the work of Jan Schmidt, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. Now, before I talk about Jens's work, I have to tell you a little bit more about the structure of the end of the chromosome. And it's a little bit like the very ends of our, sho of our shoelaces, where we need to have plastic tips to protect the shoelace so that it doesn't unravel. Uh, similarly, the ends of our chromosomes have a group of proteins attached to them uh, that are protecting or sheltering the end of the chromosome. Most of these were discovered by the laboratory of Tizia de Lange, who is at the Rockefeller University in New York City. Uh, and one of them, uh, protection of telomeres number one, shown in blue here, was discovered by Peter Baumann, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory in Boulder about 20 years ago. These proteins were all discovered. And one of the things that these proteins do in addition to protecting the end of the chromosome is to uh, recruit the telomerase ribonucleoprotein to the chromosome end. So we have mutations both in the shelter and comp complex and in the telomerase protein, the, ter 
that prevent this interaction. And then the telomerase, even though it's enzymatically active, it can't find the end of the chromosome. The telomeres are, cannot be maintained, and so they shrink with time. Now, the DNA is also very interesting at the end of the chromosome. Most of you probably have read or studied that the DNA is a double helix, and certainly in most of the chromosome, this is true. And at the telomere, these TTAGGG repeated sequences are mostly double-stranded. But at the very end of the chromosome, of every one of our chromosomes, there is a stretch of about two or 300 nucleotides that are single-stranded DNA. And this is always of the red strand, which is the strand that has the Gs in it. And so the shelter and complex has to protect both the double-stranded and the single-stranded parts of the telomere, and the telomerase has to find the single-stranded end because that is what it is able to extend. So what Jan Schmidt did to mark the ends of the chromosomes in a living cell was to use CRISPR genome editing to put a fluorescent tag on uh, one of those telomere binding proteins, one of those sheltering components called uh, telomere repeat factor two. Uh, and so he decorated all the ends of the chromosomes with one color of a fluorescent dye. He decorated all of the tert molecules, which are the telomerase with another color. And he used yet a third color, a blue color to uh, mark the Cajal body, which is a non-enveloped um, compartment within the nucleus, which is involved in ribonucleoprotein maturation. And so in this movie that I'm going to show, you will all think that I have sped it up. But in fact, this is real time. I have not sped this up. Molecules are actually moving this quickly, diffusing this quickly within the human cell nucleus. I think you can see sort of the, the edge of the nucleus here. This particular one is not quite round. It's a little bit elliptical. And the green dots are the telomerase molecules moving very quickly. The red dots are the chromosome ends, the telomeres, not moving at all on this 15 second movie they diffuse only very slowly. And then again, the Cajal bodies here and here are shown in blue. So now you will see the telomerase moving around the nucleus, looking for telomeres, sort of like angry bees in a bottle. Now I'm gonna play this again, and I want you to watch the place that I'm gonna show you right here which looks like it's yellow. So this is where a green telomerase is overlapping with a red telomere. And you can see that they stay together for the entire length of this movie. And these are the long static interactions that are long enough for the enzyme to actually do its job and extend the telomere. So, uh, the model that we can, so of course you can't just look at the pictures to understand how telomerase finds the telomere. You have to uh, track uh, thousands of particles uh, in movies to see where they're going, to see how often they find the telomere. We also use genetics and we determine um, uh, mutations uh, that disrupted this activity so that we could uh, make sure that we were seeing authentic binding events uh, because the mutations prevented those events. And then we also used uh, drugs, which prevent the telomerase from pairing with the telomeric single-stranded extension. And it was by uh, doing many, many different kinds of experiments that we came up with this understanding of how uh, human telomerase finds the telomere. So we found that it engages with the telomere transiently, short 
uh, interactions maybe a thousand times during the DNA synthetic phase of the cell cycle. So huge number, and that's because it's binding through just protein-protein interactions and has not yet found the base pairing interaction with the very end of the chromosome. So it binds, but it's not very stable and it is released. And then occasionally, much more rare, it has both this protein-protein interaction, which tells it that it's close to the chromosome end. And if it's right at the chromosome end, the base pairing between its RNA template and the single-stranded DNA, and only then is it able to lock down and actually extend the chromosome end. So in the last part of this talk, I'm going to talk about the most recent work, which has to do with a different protein complex, not shelterin, which I've already talked about, not telomerase, which I've already talked about, but instead, this CST, which is an abbreviation for the three uh, genes that make the three proteins shown that make this complex. And it uh, is responsible for stopping the telomerase from continuing to make telomeric DNA. And then it brings in uh, polymerase alpha, DNA polymerase alpha, and primase, which makes uh, an Okazaki fragment for lagging strand DNA synthesis. And this helps the complementary strand, which we call the C strand, to be made at the chromosome end. And Carolyn Price, who's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, did many of the pioneering, much of the pioneering work on this system. So I had a, a extremely talented postdoctoral fellow from Singapore. His name was CJ Lim, and he uh, succeeded in doing what had been very difficult for many years in the field, which was to determine the molecular structure of this CST complex, which is an accessory factor for polymerase alpha. Now, initially, he uh, was able to get the structure to six angstroms resolution. And you will remember that a, uh, an atomic bond in chemistry is about an angstrom unit across. So six angstroms is not good enough to really see individual uh, atoms or amino acids in a protein, but it was good enough for us to uh, dock into this structure some previously determined crystal structures of little pieces of CST. And it was then that we knew that we were at least on the right track. So what do you do if you are stuck uh, in a structural biology project and cannot get the really beautiful resolution that you would like? Well, the trick, as my friend Tom Stites always used to tell me when we were skiing together, he would say, you always add the relevant partners of the, uh, of the protein. Because even if that makes it larger, which you might think would make it harder to solve the structure, it makes it perhaps more locked down and uniform in structure, less dynamic. And so what partner did we add? We added single-stranded telomeric DNA, TTAGGG repeats. And we had a surprise. Not only was the structure now much more uh, solid and much easier to solve by cryo-electron microscopy, but it self-assembled into this enormous decamer, 10 subunits. Here's a side view. Here's a view from the top. Uh, and this superstructure is something that had not been anticipated, had not been predicted, and we still do not know what function the superstructure, the decamer has, uh, and what's, what functions the smaller unit, for example, this one shown in cyan, which is a single CST 
uh, heterotrimer, what functions it has. But we were able, the, the, now the resolution was so good that you can see that the electron density, which is this gray web, could easily be fit with the amino acids. We can see the amino acids. Uh, this one must be one that has a long side chain. This turned out to be an arginine. Here's one that is flat. That turns out to be a, 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 an aromatic ring of a tyrosine. So CJ Lim was able to fit in uh, de novo, which means without any cheating, without any using previous structures, um, 70, the 70% 70 of the CTC1 structure that had never been determined before. And he was also able to find that a part of the telomeric DNA was very well positioned within the protein complex. And so uh, only four nucleotides were really rigidly oriented. The rest of the DNA was more flexible and we could not trace it. So that's the structure of CST. Now, how about its function? So what we've been doing recently in the laboratory is to look at the ability of CST to um, coordinate polymerase alpha and primase to make this C strand. And in this particular gel electrophoresis, we are, uh, first of all, showing you the telomerase reaction products, the TTAGGG, in this case, just as a, a, a way of getting oriented to find out what size is running at each position. So this beautiful ladder of telomerase products um, was what uh, Blackburn and Greider originally saw uh, with tetrahymena, but this is the human telomerase. So the, in this case, this is just serving to get you oriented for what size products we're seeing. And then the, these dark bands and these dark bands that are increasing as we do longer reaction times are the C-strand products that are being made on the telomeric DNA as a template. And so um, this is what the polymerase alpha primase is able to make. And like the, somewhat like the telomerase ladder, it also has a six nucleotide repeat, a little bit less specific than the telomerase one, but nonetheless quite apparent. And this quantification just shows you that the synthesis is linear for a period of the two hours that we ran the reaction for. So why is there this six nucleotide ladder of C strand products? Well, this gray cartoon is the telomere single stranded DNA and it is the repeats of this TTAGGG. It's the sequence is backwards because I'm going five prime to three prime from right to left in this case. And each of these gray boxes represents one of these telomeric repeats. So as a template, we are using multiple telomeric repeats. Now, if the CST positions poly alpha primase on the left end, then it will make a product shown in green that is of length 16 nucleotides shorter than the length of the template. But what if, but it, every repeat, set of repeats is an equal target for this uh, CST poly alpha primase. So what if it sits in the purple position instead? Well, then it'll make a product that is six nucleotides shorter. It's N minus 22. And what if it sits in the position shown in blue, then it will make uh, one that is yet six nucleotides shorter, et cetera. It can start at any of these positions, and that's how we get the six nucleotide ladder. And we've been able to, we're very excited, we've been able to get the complete telomere DNA replication by putting everything together in the same test tube. We can put telomerase together with CST Paul alpha primase and we get both G-strand and C-strand synthesis. We are radioactively labeling here only the C-strand, but we know that the G-strand must be there 
because if we don't um, have the telomerase there, we don't get any of these products being made. So the telomerase makes the G strand and then the CST pole alpha primase makes the C strand. And we have a number of controls that convince us that these are authentic products. And what does this zero minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes mean? Well, zero minutes means that we mix everything together right at the beginning and we do get products formed after one hour. But if we give the telomerase a 10 minute head start or a 30 minute or a 60 minute head start, we get uh, more product being formed. And so the reaction works a little bit better if we give the telomerase some time to make the template before we add the CST pole alpha primase. And we think that by studying this reaction in the test tube, we can understand the atomic details of everything that is happening for telomere replication to occur. Our current model is shown here in a cartoon form that the telomerase um, has this orange RNA template. It uses a primer of telomeric DNA. You can think of this as the end of a human chromosome, but in our reactions, it is a synthetic oligonucleotide containing three telomeric repeats. Telomerase makes a long copy of that, multiple telomeric repeats, and then CST polyalpha primase uses that as a template and makes the C strand first laying down an RNA primer, then extending the RNA primer, then switching over to the Paul alpha subunit, which makes the C strand DNA, and it can go all the way to the end of the template. So in conclusion, what I've tried to explain today, and I hope that uh, I was at least somewhat successful, is that telomerase is the enzyme that extends uh, the telomeric overhang at the ends of each of our chromosomes. That it is a, an RNA plus a protein. The protein is called telomerase reverse transcriptase. That the discovery of TERT by Joachim Lingner in Boulder, Colorado, about 25 years ago, was done first in Euplodes, but we quickly were able to jump to the human version, and that gave us a clue about how telomerase is reactivated in cancer cells. We can watch single molecules of telomerase search for telomeres, and this has allowed us to understand the recruitment of telomerase to this very rare uh, end of the chromosome. And finally, we've determined the structure of the CST complex and seen through enzymatic assays how it can coordinate Paul alpha primase to synthesize the C strand of the telomere. And what is the future of this field? Well, first of all, we would like to inhibit cancer metastasis by inhibiting telomerase activity, or perhaps inhibiting this CST complex, which is required for the C-strand synthesis, or perhaps inhibiting the recruitment of telomerase to the chromosome ends. And then on the other hand, if we have diseases of stem cell insufficiency, such as dyskeratosis congenita, we would prefer to upregulate telomerase so that we could better maintain stem cell activity. Here is my laboratory on a hike that we take every summer. Uh, and uh, you can see that we enjoy uh, uh, a variety of people from many different countries and many different backgrounds working together on these problems. And in particular today, I would like to thank uh, Lingner, Schmidt, and Lim, who are all now have left my lab and have their own laboratories, their professors throughout the world and also uh, Debbie Woodke, my colleague at CU Boulder, Art Zog, who did the most recent experiments on the CST Paul Alpha primase is in my laboratory and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for funding. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tom, for the wonderful talk. So we have some questions. 
Um, the first question from Bing Lu. Hi, Professor Chek. May I know your opinion about the potential use of telomerase to prolong lifespan and rejuvenation? Thanks. Well, first of all, I am pleased to be here and I send my greetings to all of you around the world. I've had a very nice time talking to a group of students and young scientists. And I would like to know whether you can hear me adequately. Is, can you hear me okay? Yes. So I, I think that um, telomerase activation um, in uh, older human beings um, certainly could be used to prolong the proliferative lifespan of certain types of cells, such as stem cells, if they are not dividing very well because of the lack of telomerase. However, it could be a very dangerous sort of therapy in general because it is one step towards cancer. And so um, rampant reactivation of telomerase in adult humans um, would uh, be a bad thing. And we know this because there are genetic diseases where telomerase is active, uh, e exceptionally active uh, because of a promoter mutation uh, in humans and they get multiple cancers. Thank you. Another question from Josephine Wong. What are the challenges for using telomerase targeting therapies in cancer? To, to, uh, challenges for using telomerase with- targeting, targeting therapies in cancer. Well, um, thus far, it has been difficult to make a, a small molecule inhibitor that works very effectively against telomerase. Perhaps because telomerase is such an intrinsically slow and inefficient enzyme, it doesn't need to work very well in order to maintain telomeres. And so you would need a very good drug to shut it down. Um, the other challenges are the possible side effects by inhibiting the growth of stem cells um, if you inhibit telomerase, because there are some tissues in the adult body, such as stem cells, where uh, continued proliferation is required. Another question by Jennifer Love. With the discovery of CRISPR and mRNA vaccines, it certainly is an exciting age for RNA biology. What do you believe are the major next steps for both basic and applied RNA research? Well, thank you for that question. Of course, I love RNA, so I am pleased to talk about this. Um, I think that the, uh, in terms of basic research, the, the big area for the future are the long non-coding RNAs. They outnumber the messenger RNAs in human cells by a large amount. Uh, they are extremely tissue specific, so they are different long non-coding RNAs produced in, uh, in the brain, in the eye, in the skin, in the liver. Um, and, and so that makes them uh, very interesting, uh, this tissue specificity. And their functions are, to be honest, quite, quite unknown. Even the most heavily studied ones, are con the functions are still controversial. But a number of them are, are essential, uh, and there are, um, uh, there's good reason to believe that they are doing something important. So that's the big area for the future. There may be more than 100,000 of these long non-coding RNAs encoded by the human genome. In terms of the applied um, research, I think the big question right now is this stabilized messenger RNA used by both Moderna and BioNTech Pfizer for the vaccines, how general will that be as a therapeutic? I think that it will be useful for additional vaccines, although how, whether it will completely take over uh, the vaccine world is yet to be determined. But how about beyond that? Uh, and the most exciting possibility might be that 
monoclonal antibodies, which are currently produced as pharmaceuticals in with Chinese hamster cells in big fermenters that perhaps instead of producing the monoclonal antibodies as a drug, one could inject a messenger RNA encoding the monoclonal antibody, and that might be very effective in some cases. But we just don't know. It's going to take the next 10 years to figure that out. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, there's another question from Suminma Singh. What is your advice to young scientists who want to make breakthrough discoveries? Can one do that in the industry? Will one's ideas discoveries remain their own? Yes, well, uh, certainly industry uh, is, is a good place to make discoveries. Um, there tends to be a lot of teamwork uh, in industry, which I think is very healthy, people working together towards a common goal. Um, I, there's more freedom to make discoveries in academic uh, laboratories where there's not the pressure of having to produce a product which can be sold to keep the company in business. But uh, it, my students, uh, and, and uh, postdoctoral fellows have really gone in both directions, both in, toward, in academia and also into industry. And I think there are um, opportunities for creativity uh, in both cases. Thank you very much. So there's another question. Um, about animal models. So would it be possible to use a model such as the naked mole rat to further understand how to discover and utilize the potential applications of telomeres? Uh, yes, um, some of the, I, I, I'm not, um, I, I think I would know a naked mole rat if I saw one, but I do not know much about its telomere biology. <laughs> The more uh, common rodent that is studied, of course, is the mouse, Mus musculus, and its telomere biology is actually quite distinct from that of humans. That mice have, the laboratory mice have extremely long telomeres. And so this is not considered to be a, have the cancer relationship that it does in humans perhaps unnecessary because mice don't live uh, very long and cancer is to some extent a, a disease of older organisms. And so um, right now, much of our work on telomerase is being done in human uh, tissue culture cells, uh, which we think uh, at least for very fundamental processes is a good starting point. Um, we, we also have two questions that both related to specificity of targeting of um, telomerase and whether there could be a way to target basically telomerase specifically without the side effects of disrupting other um, cells like stem cells. Yes, well, um, of course, one way to specifically target it to cancer cells might be to um, attach the, the drug to something that um, will target it to cancer cells only. And there are very exciting um, uh, advances in the area of linking antibodies to drugs and making an antibody drug conjugate. Then if the antibody could recognize the tumor cell and deliver an anti-telomerase drug, this might be a possibility. So I think uh, the future holds some, some opportunities. Um, thank you so much. I think in the interest of time, we'll have one last question. So in what way would you expect modern AI methods to come into play in RNA research field? Well, I just happen to have an article here from Science Magazine by, uh, written by a friend of mine, Riju Das, 
Stanford University with his collaborator, Dror. And the title of this article, it's featured right on the cover of the magazine. It's not very old. It is from August of 2021, so six months ago. It's called Artificial Intelligence Reveals RNA Structure. So I think the future in this area is bright, and I encourage you to look up this article. And Thank that you. was pure luck that I happened to have that sitting right next to me. Thank you so much, Tom, for answering all the questions and for your wonderful talk. And thanks, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Today, we are privileged to have invited Professor Cedric Villani here with us virtually to give the final plenary lecture for the 2022 edition of GYSS. He is most well known for his work around Landau damping, the Boltzmann equation, and optimal transport, for subsets of which he was awarded the EMS Prize in 2008, the Fermat Prize, and the Henri Poincare Prize in 2009, the much coveted Fields Medal in 2010, and many other awards. He is a well respected author and has also received the Duke Prize from AMS. He wears many more hats beyond a mathematician and author, but I am personally most thankful for his extraordinary efforts in promoting mathematics and sharing his journey to the public, which I am sure have motivated many young scientists in their path to, be, to being mathematicians. Without further ado, let us now have Professor Villani share with us his mathematical career and achievements and his advice for budding young mathematicians. Professor Villani, please. Hello, Singapore. Hello, GYSS. This is Cedric Villani speaking. Here to deliver a plenary lecture about elements of my career, how I became a mathematician, my subject of study, my outreach activities, and things like this that I hope can be of any help or inspiration to the enthusiastic youth out there. I always loved math as far as I remember. So, as a child, always liking to concentrate on the shapes, on ordering things, on searching for things, on concentrating. And uh, I learned math at school. My parents were teachers of uh, literature, so they could not help me much about science. And my teachers were extremely helpful and influential, especially some of them uh, when I was like uh, 14, 15 years old. I remember them very vividly. But a large part I also read through books. I was an avid reader and um, always interested in books and knowing more with a lot of curiosity. Maybe mathematics was not my favorite subject. Maybe the subject which I most loved among all is evolutionary biology. You know, uh, fantastic, amazing variety of shapes, behaviors, uh, dinosaurs, and whatever, the uh, evolution of uh, the living beings, and so on. I felt this was the most beautiful subject that there could ever be greatest show on earth, which by the way is the title of a song by uh, my beloved 
um, rock band Nightwish, all about evolution of species. So this was my favorite subject, probably. But in mathematics, there also was something very special. Mathematics is not a science like any science. Mathematics is special because all the knowledge you need to have is within you. Everything is based on logical reasoning. And um, that's the only subject for which you don't have to trust necessarily the teacher when he or she is speaking. Maybe you are able, as a teenager, to spot a mistake in the reasoning of the teacher, and then the teacher has to admit the mistake normally. This happened to me a couple of times when I was a student in high school. My love for mathematics certainly comes very much from the fact that it's associated so much with inner life, with the possibility of thinking deep inside uh, yourself. And uh, it's something like an enigma, playing with the concepts, trying to find the right way to assemble them. Aristotle used to say that mathematics is the greatest form of beauty in the reasoning, and that beauty there manifests itself in the accuracy, in the ordering, in the commensurability, the relationships between the concepts and the numbers and the things. And I was very sensitive to this kind of aesthetics of the mathematical ingredients of a proof, how the elements can get together. Mathematics is the art of proof and reasoning. And if you love reasoning, normally you love mathematics, and if you love mathematics, you have to love reasoning. I remember vividly when I learned about what is a proof, and what is it when you are putting up your reasoning. I was 12 years old, I was at school, and the teacher was explaining, now we are going to demonstrate. I remember thinking, oh, this is interesting, and this was an important moment in my life. And somehow, in the coming 12 years after that, my progress in math was just every year learn to devise proofs more complicated, more sophisticated than the year before more sophisticated arguments and more complicated reasonings, thinking for longer periods of time, etc. And after this period, when I was age 24, came what I believe is my first nice result in 1997, when by that time, as a researcher doing my PhD, after an encounter with uh, uh, Italian researcher Giuseppe Toscani, I was able, together with him, to find some good results, some nice results. Uh, lower bound for the production of entropy in the model of the specially homogeneous Boltzmann equation for a certain kind of interactions. Wow! What subject is that? When I was 12 years old, I was doing some, you know, arguments of 10 lines, maybe proofs of 10 lines about uh, simple geometric problems. By age 24, uh, around the end of my PhD, I was making complicated papers of 50 pages, maybe more, uh, with all kinds of reasonings and long formulas and whatever. And the subject was mathematical physics. Why did I go in mathematical physics? It was not my intention. When I entered École Normale Supérieure, a kind of elitist school for sciences and literature, when I entered École Normale Supérieure in mathematics, 
1992, my favorite subject was algebra. But after a little bit of time, my favorite subject became analysis for some good and some bad reasons. One of the reasons why that uh, through partial differential equations and dynamical systems, I hope to be able to do some mathematical biology and connect this with my lifetime love of uh, biological uh, beings, uh, like uh, ecosystems, evolution, and so on. But didn't turn out to be the case. Following some advice by some of my professors, I went into the study of uh, theory of gas, Boltzmann equation. I remember this is the first book which I read, the first book of research level by the late Carlo Cercignani, one of the main experts of Boltzmann equation who had read everything and written about everything about the Boltzmann equation. I would never have bet when I was in high school that I would go into mathematical physics. Boltzmann equation is the equation written down by Maxwell and Boltzmann in the 1860s, 1870s to describe the statistics of a huge collection of balls bumping into each other, gas from the atomic hypothesis. It was a fantastic subject in those days, very much daring. Who would have bet on these atoms in those days? And these guys were outstanding scientists, amazing. But when I was in high school, preparatory classes, I did not think highly of gas theory, thermodynamics. Subject looked boring to me. I never was in those days passionate about physics. And when I was in high school, by the way, my favorite field was geometry. However, I ended up going partial differential equations going in the study of uh, mathematical theory of gas, and I fell in love with it, literally. Discovered a subject full of beauty for the encounter between the statistical physics, probability theory, information theory, with the entropy measuring the kind of disorder, information that there is in statistical distribution of particles, but also fluid mechanics, applications in various fields of technology and some amazing problems, big problems. Can you think that nobody currently has a good, sound, rigorous mathematical theory to explain phase transition in full rigor? Phase transition, like when water becomes too cool, it becomes like ice. When it becomes very hot, it will turn into vapor. Nobody has a full theory about this. These are familiar phenomena and still full of amazing mystery. And I went into this subject and really discovered enormous beauty. I was guided by my PhD advisor, Pierre Lyons, who received the Fields Medal in 1994, at about the time as I was starting my PhD with him also guided by my tutor at École Normale Supérieure, Yann Brunier, uh, guided by later people whom I encountered, like Michel Ledoux, probably from Toulouse, Eric Carlen, mathematical physicist from uh, uh, Atlanta in those days. I always thought uh, these four persons were like my four advisors, very much influential so that I learned from them ideas and tools and techniques. They had different techniques and tools, and my style was a kind of synthesis between theirs. And uh, so you see, it so happened that I was in this subject and I would never have predicted this. In life, you always have, I believe strongly this, to leave a good dose of chance in what will occur to you. And there it was eventually, my PhD thesis, defended in 1998, so I was almost 25 years old. PhD 
is certainly the most important diploma in science. Not the highest one, it's not the first one, but it's the first one in which the advisor, in which the master, gives you a problem that nobody knows if there is a solution. Even he or she does not know. And you go, so you really become a researcher, searching for a problem, fighting against the unknown, when you are working on your PhD. And when you defend your PhD, you are the expert of that subject and you explain that research. And then you know if you're fit for research or if you will find another job that there is something that there is absolutely no shame to have, of course. So I love the research. It was a life that I would never have thought of. You know, I was a very shy kid with a lot of internal life. In my PhD, I started to travel like crazy, meet people by the hundreds in conferences, work and work on so many problems. And my life started to be so full of problems and problems and problems again. And I would love this. Publishing number of papers per year, uh, having collaborators on various continents, not sleeping much, meeting and everybody and visiting dozens of countries, going from conference to conference, etc. Something which I really loved. And another thing which I loved and from the beginning was extremely keen on is about writing synthesis work, synthesis book. Even nowadays, in retrospect, when I look at my mathematical career, I think that maybe this is the activity for which I was most gifted. And uh, uh, I always was a teacher, this is in my blood, always wanted to teach things which I just learned. This is my first significant book, Topics in Optimal Transportation. It grew up out of a course which I taught in Atlanta in 1999. You see, I had been in Atlanta because I was invited by Eric Carlen, who was part of my PhD jury. When I was there, I presented some results which I had obtained with some German colleague in some conference. In the presentation in Atlanta, there was a colleague from Benin who was extremely gifted, French-speaking, we got along very well. So he invited me back in Atlanta to teach a course. He wanted a course on optimal transport, which was not my specialty, but which was related to my PhD subject and which I had done a little bit of work on. Optimal transport is the art of transporting matter from one initial configuration to another initial configuration, spending the least possible amount of energy. A subject that goes back to the 18th century with developments, very important developments in the 20th century, and which had some extraordinary growth um, around the end of the 20th century, beginning of 21st century. That's the time when I was in Atlanta, 1999. Subject was burgeoning. I did not, I was not a specialist, but I was ready to take up the challenge. Learned and learned listen carefully or read so many papers and discuss with the experts and the specialists and taught the course, wrote notes from the course and uh, wrote proofs and uh, uh, the course eventually turned out to be this book which even nowadays, still nowadays is very much used and kind of popular as the first book in the subject for PhD students, graduate students. So the best way to learn a subject is to teach it, that's for sure. And I became with that an expert on the subject and started to add this. So I was working on the Boltzmann equation, but also working on optimal transportation, going conferences about this, about their life became even more complicated. Books became more complicated. Here is another of my books on optimal transport. This one is almost 1,000 pages long. Took really some big part, some part of my life, I think the three years of work, something like that. And when I read it, I think, gosh, how could I 
do this in only three years. The book received a prize, like a prize for a book which is particularly clear and uh, particularly ambitious, ambitious as a synthesis and so on. So it was also part of my life. Research life is searching, discussing, traveling, meeting, writing, teaching, teaching again, teaching your PhD students who become collaborators, teaching uh, your graduate students, etc., etc. And I'm very French in my training. You know that mathematics is a very strong skill in France. And France is certainly the nation which has the highest number of math the decorations and rewards in mathematics if you uh, divide by the population and second largest country in terms of number of field medals in the world after US. So very much French but also very much European with collaborators in Italy, in Germany, in, uh, in Spain, etc. But also with some important trips to the big American university campuses in Atlanta, Berkeley, Princeton, each time for six month period. I received number of authors. I, however, always believed it was important for me to go back to France and continue to have my main activity there, teach there, and endorse some responsibilities. My most important work, maybe, or the one that gave rise to the Fields Medal, is the one on Landau damping, which is a particular damping mechanism, equilibration mechanism for plasmas. Think of plasma as a soup of electrons. And um, uh, there is there are the electrons and there are the positive charges, but the electrons move much faster than the positive charges. So the dynamics of the electrons is dominating. And if you are near equilibrium and you perturb a little bit, would you expect that it would go back to equilibrium, to zero electric field? It's not obvious, because in plasma physics, the main equation, the Vlasov equation, does not have any friction, no collision, no irreversibility, no entropy increase. Friction is the main mechanism in our world for equilibration. That's fundamental in our world, around us. Cars would not be able to stop without the friction, etc., etc. Friction is what also makes internal friction, the viscosity is what makes water go down back to equilibrium after you agitate it or uh, throw stone in it. But in plasma, there is no friction. And however, there is, under some circumstances, some assumptions, some conditions, there is equilibration. It's called the Landau damping, and uh, in 2009, 2009, together with my former student and uh, main collaborator at the time, Clément Mouraud, we solved this problem. That is, we gave a mathematical proof based on this Vlasov equation that if you take a plasma in equilibrium around a very smooth statistical distribution of electrons and perturb it just a little bit, then you will go back to equilibrium in a way that can be characterized and estimate the speed and so on. This was a work absolutely full of unknowns and uh, long work. It's about 200 pages of proof with some long proofs, with some uh, with some new functional spaces, with some new techniques, and so on. It's a work that lasted for two years and a half, in which many people were met. In the acknowledgement at the beginning of the article, by the way, this is the list of all people that we thank uh, for giving us some insights and some tools so that we were able to perform this work up to the end. We made so many mistakes along the way, it's like something like crazy, but eventually we believed and 
he managed to go uh, through all these mistakes and correct them until the paper finally was published. Paper was decisive for getting the Fields Medal and uh, because it was solving an old problem but also because it was giving some tools that would make it possible to solve some problems. You know, work have to, has to have some posterity, some consequences, and the tools we used were developed, augmented by other people and by gifted researchers to solve some long-standing problems of stability of fluid mechanics and so on. So this is what uh, eventually gave the gave rise to uh, that particular day, which I will remember all my life. It was 19 August 2010 when there was this big ceremony at the opening of the International Congress of Mathematicians, and I was receiving, along with three other mathematicians, the Fields Medal. Fields Medal is like a life-changing event you in the light, it gives you the opportunity to have visibility much beyond the borders of your community of scientists, so that you start to go on the radio, on the television programs, doing public lectures, teaching to kids, uh, doing all kinds of interventions, etc. I not only was always interested in this synthesis, teaching and so on, but also I had been trained in a culture uh, in Lyon in which it was very important for us to communicate to the society and to do some outreach. And so I accepted many of the missions and challenges that my fellow field medalists had rather declined. I became president of association, I became director of institute, I started to organize some public debates, movie debates. I started to write books. This, is, uh, this was uh, uh, the main success of my writing books, Birth of a Theorem or Living Theorem, a book which is about giving the reader the sense of adventure and unknown human adventure that there is in the mathematical research. It was translated in 15 languages or so, including, of course, English, including uh, Chinese, and a number, of course, of other languages, showing that in research there is the science, and when you want to talk about the science, you need to use some simple words to communicate to the outside world, but there is also the human adventure, the fact that there are emotions, dreams, ambitions, cooperation, fear, hope, etc., etc. And I wanted to convey all this that there is in the research life and why it is that it makes us so passionate about it. I went on recording some public lectures and a series of stand-up, quite some work, this stuff. I had to find a producer, I had to raise money, I had to write up the, 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 the lectures. It's a set of eight one-hour lectures and so on, uh, intended for all kinds of uh, audience, quite some work. But also I wrote some uh, comic books together with some drawers. I uh, wrote the text for some artists, I made some dialogue books, etc., etc. Loving it and emphasizing the fact that mathematics is part of society with the applications, but also is part of the culture, part of the intellectual pride of making the ideas live. It's not just about solving problems and uh, about finding some theorems with maybe some applications and techniques, it's also about being part of the culture and uh, the, the pride of making ideas live. I even started to go in politics after that. This was 2010, just after the Field Medal, starting to be in the uh, militants for federalist Europe. I am 
it's called a federalist, people who believe that Europe has to unite much more so that the nations be stronger and have a chance to continue influencing the uh, course of the world. And uh, it's something that for many years I stood up for, like before me mathematician Henri Cartan, convinced that also the European experience which I had led through my training was very much representative of what we have to do for our youth. That Europe will be strong by the cooperation and travels and network between the youth. This eventually, after a long series of events, led me into national politics, French politics. I ended up being elected together with, uh, being elected as a member of parliament at the time of when uh, Emmanuel Macron was elected president of the Republic. I was very much seduced by the European line of the party of Emmanuel Macron. And uh, once in Parliament, started to do my best to make the interaction between science and politics in a time in which Politics needs science more than ever, because science is in the study of global warming, science is in ecology and the study of the living, science is in the study of the health, in the study of technology, of energy making, and everything. I was in charge of a report on artificial intelligence, which became the basis of the strategy for France in artificial intelligence, doing a lot of lectures about this also in charge of a report about the teaching of mathematics to improve the quality of our teaching in France, which does have a lot of problems, even though we train some high-level researchers, we have problems with our students. Um, and we did a lot of adventures again, and encounters, and new files in, uh, as a member of parliament, reports about various subjects even ran for mayor of Paris. It was not successful, but it was quite an adventure. Here is the program which I had for, for Paris City. I'm very proud of the program even nowadays, even though, as I realized, the election was not at all about having the best program, but it was about a lot of other stuff. It was also a strong human experience, with hundreds of people associated with the with that uh, application, with that running for mayor. And it failed, but never failed. It was, you know, sentenced by uh, 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 Nelson Mandela. If I win, I win. If I lose, I learn. So this was also some good learning. And nowadays, still continuing to do my best making the interaction between science and politics. I am the president of the French Scientific Parliamentary Office, which puts together members of parliament from the lower and upper chambers working on some scientific subjects with political content to help Parliament make decisions about subjects with strong science, like nuclear energy, diseases, vaccination, or quantum strategy, or neurotechnologies, or uh, the future of antibiotics, or uh, plastic pollution, or biodiversity collapse, etc., etc. Making also the best to put my experience in the at the service of uh, political ecology. Nowadays, actually, after, for some good and some bad reasons, I got into some uh, argument with my former party. I got out of the party. Now I'm part of the, the uh, ecologist movement, of the environmentalists. Yesterday, I was on Twitch doing a special 
broadcast discussion with some experts about the collapse of insect biodiversity as part of the presidential campaign for the Greens but also, as you see, as part of my efforts to make it that in politics, we don't just speak of the usual boring subjects, but we also speak of what really matters, the understanding of the world, the planet that we will leave to the future, and our way to go through the huge difficulties that our world and environment is going through today and how we can improve it putting science and knowledge at the service of a better life and still trying to do that in the future. As you can see, this is still to be continued. Thank you for listening. Please receive all my very best regards and encouragements for your future success. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Due to time zone differences, Professor Villani will regrettably not be able to join us for questions and answers today. On behalf of Professor Villani and the organizing team, we thank you for your understanding and we hope that you had a fruitful and enjoyable time at GYSS 2022. And that concludes our final session in the 10th anniversary edition of the Global Young Scientists Summit. It has been five days of illuminating lectures and engaging discussions. We are heartened to see many of you participating so actively, and we hope you've enjoyed yourselves and will continue to keep in touch with each other. If you missed out on any lectures and presentations, do head on to the NRF YouTube page, as all sessions are uploaded there for you to catch up on. Before I bid you farewell, I have three more short program items to update you about. Firstly, the time capsule. We received many, many creative contributions and we look forward to opening it in 10 years time to see whether any of your predi predictions have come true. We will now seal the time capsule, which we will open in 2032. Next, I'd like to invite our organizing committee co-chairs, Professor Lo Tek Singh and Professor Bertil Anderson, to close the summit with a few words. Thereafter, Professor Lo will be announcing the winners of the video challenge. I know many of you have been looking forward to this, so do stay on for that. Thank you once again for joining us at GYSS 2022. Professors, please. Speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the closing session of the Global Young Scientists Summit 2022. This is a milestone edition as we celebrate 10 years of bringing together scientists from different disciplines and cultures for exchanges of ideas and conversations on issues that matter to both the scientific community and society at large. We started the Global Young Scientists Summit a decade ago on the belief that such interactions among promising young scientists and illustrious science and technology leaders will provide fresh perspective, inspiration and collaboration opportunities that are all key for scientific progress. We are very heartened to learn 
that our past participants had found this experience useful and inspiring. And the Global Young Scientists Summit will remain committed to excite, engage, and enable the next generation of scientific leaders. GYSS has grown over the past 10 years, and our network of speakers and participants continue to increase. Like last year, we have hosted the summit online, and I'm very happy to see such strong participation from our young scientists from all over the world. More than 500 of our participants were able to take part in the small group sessions with our speakers. On top of that, networking opportunities based on shared interests were made available to all participants. This year, we have once again conducted the GYSS Video Challenge, where our participants could share short videos about their science stories and inspirations. We have also included a new segment for 19 young scientists to present their work to their fellow peers. We hope that you have enjoyed and benefited from these exciting and vibrant exchanges with the speakers and fellow young scientists in the past five days. For 10 years, the GIS invites eminent scientists from different disciplines to provide their insights uh, and share their experience with our young participants. Speakers in the summit include recipients of the Nobel Prize, Fields Medal, Millennium Technology Prize, Turning Award, and the IEEE Medal of Honor. We are heartened to have four new speakers join us this year, including the most recent awardee of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. We are also deeply grateful for the continuous support that many of our speakers have provided to GIS over the past decade. And here, I would like to thank all our 21 speakers for their commitment and participation in the summit and our jubilee event, some of whom had to do so at late hours due to the time difference. Science is not only the corner state of great advances of the past, but also even more important today to solve global challenges and meet societal needs. In this 10th edition of GIS, we have looked back at some of the key scientific developments, and more importantly, discussed the future possibilities in science and technology. We have also asked for your predictions and wishes for the greatest advancements and scientific in invention in the next decade. We certainly hope that you will join us in 10 years' time to revisit these predictions. And to the young scientists, we hope that you will continue pursuing your passions in science and work towards bringing these predictions to reality. On that note, I would like to thank all of you once again for your participation, invite you for next year's 11th edition of GIS. GIS 2023 will be held in Singapore tentatively from the 10th to the 13th of January. And I really hope we can finally meet in person in Singapore. Until then, stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again next year. Dear participants, the final segment of our GYSS 2022 is the announcement of the winners of our video contest, which gave the contestants the opportunity to share with us their science story. We thank everyone for putting in the effort for contributing your ideas to the contest. The videos for the panel's choice award were evaluated by a panel of reviewers based on four criteria, engagement, illumination, creativity, and overall quality of the video. The winner of this award is the video titled Shed Light on 3D Bioprinting, created by Ricardo Rizzo from ETH Zurich. Together with current light technologies, we end up having such a powerful set of tools that makes me sometimes feel like a modern wizard. A little wave of magic wand and the precious help of brilliant colleagues. And we're able to print extremely tiny structures with this technique called to photon stereolithography. We also have two other awards, the People's Choice Awards. 
These are based on their popularity indicated by rewards they garnered. The top two most popular videos were one, batteryless implantable medical devices created by Nora Almari from University College London. Opto comes from the word light and genetics come from genes. So what we do is make the nerves act like a plant to respond to the light that comes from the tiny implant. So when the light comes to the tiny implant, the nerves get excited and become healthy again. Two, vision beyond vision, my journey into the world of special needs, created by Rebecca Chakram from LV Prasad Eye Institute India and City University of London. She realized the importance of checking the reliability of the vision tools and was curious to understand the relationship between the brain development of these children and how well they can see. My heartiest congratulations to the three winners. You have each won yourselves a round trip ticket to Singapore to attend GYSS 2023. We hope to be able to meet and host you all in sunny Singapore. And to everyone who took part in this video contest, thank you very much for participating and sharing with us your great stories. Have a great year ahead. Thank you very much.